Saņemiet ar aplausiem, please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Rūds Feltanārs no Amsterdams. A very good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm more than honored and pleased uh, to be here in uh, Riga and uh, share with you a story about, uh, about the future, uh, about the future of society, about the future of our business, uh, about the future of us and the future of you and you and you. Uh, but uh, you have now the advantage that you know my name and I have the disadvantage that I don't know who you are, what your name is. So that's a huge disadvantage. So I would like to solve that instantly in 10 seconds. So my question to you is to rise all for 10 seconds. Please stand up for 10 seconds so that we can dissolve this, uh, this disbalance in having each other's name. Uh, what the meaning is now for the next 15 seconds, I'm gonna count to three, and at three you take a very, very, very deep breath, something like <sighs> this. And then at three, you shout as loud as you can your first name, then your surname, and then uh, nice to meet you, something like that. It's a bit odd, but it's going to be more odd over the next 45 minutes. So, so here we go. One, two, three. Ah! You have a very long name, sir. Thank you very much. Please sit down. Thank you very much, Latvia. Uh, you won the prize of uh, amazing people who can shout. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I will start my story, uh, a future story, uh, about what happened to me more than two months ago. I was invited to give a lecture for 250 doctors at an academical center in London. Uh, and the reason that they invited me was that they had a party. Uh, they had a party with another hospital. And uh, the reason for the party was that they introduced their electronic patient file system. It's a system of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of euros, even more, it's millions and millions to introduce this system. And uh, from 1999 till 2009, I was the chairman of um, an uh, investor capitalist uh, and responsible for investing $5 billion uh, on all continents. And one of the investments we did was investing in this technology. This is an electronic patient file, only it cost $60. So uh, that was, uh, I think, good news for the doctors, but uh, they were a bit surprised that technology like this exists. So I explained to them how this small electronic patient file works. Uh, it's, it's here under your skin in your hand, $60, and it contains your total medical history, what kind of medicine you use, everything. And uh, you always have it with you, so no matter where you travel to, you always have your medical file with you, which is important if an accident happens to you and you are somewhere in Africa. And then one of the doctors said, well, that's not a very safe system. I said, it's extremely safe. It's ex extremely safe. Because you can only read or write uh, to this uh, uh, medical device with more than three terabytes of information capacity uh, after a scan of your iris and a print of your thumb and entering your PIN code. So only in the combination with these three entities you have access to a medical file. And then one doctor said in the back, but I, that's exactly what I mean. This system is not safe because if they take out your eye and cut your thumb, put a pistol against your head and get your PIN code, then they have access to your medical file. I said, that's very true, but then you also have something else on your mind than just access to your electronic patient file. It's amazing how people fight against new technology when it is not uh, directly in their interest or when it is competing with something that they are favoring. So I asked these doctors, what is wrong with this picture? Where do you see the error uh, in this picture? Uh, and one of them said, there is no patient. I said, no, you're wrong. There's definitely a patient. It's laying on his stomach. He's operated on his back, on his nerve system. 
uh, and because it's an operation on his nerve system, it's impossible to do it with your hand. They are not tight enough. Uh, it's impossible to do it by, by eye because uh, it's too small. You can't see it with your eyes. And that's why these two doctors are using paddles to operate the robot arms and using micro, micro, micro microscopes to see the nerves. So there is definitely a patient, and they didn't see what's wrong with this picture, while you, as an audience, see it immediately. The distance from these two doctors to the patient here is less than five meters. If it's five meters with current technology today, it can also be 50 meters. And it can also be 500 meters. Then we had the first reaction from the audience, well, well, that's ridiculous, 500 meters, it's, odd, it's impossible. And I said, if it can be 500 meters, it can also be 5,000 kilometers. And then I lost my audience. They were totally gone, and they thought that it was ridiculous what I was trying to tell them. To. So it's very important as a speaker that you then get your support back from your audience. So I showed them this picture. This picture. And suddenly there was interest. Uh, uh, how does this technology work? Is it, really p is it really possible to do it from Maui or from Bali or from any other place in the world? I say, yeah, in, technically from, from a theoretical point of view, yes, it, it is possible. But only this is not the future. It's not the future because if we can do it from Maui or from Bali or any other place in the world, we can also do it from New Delhi. And I said, yeah, but well, why New Delhi? We don't have a second or third home in New Delhi. I said, no, no, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about 50,000 doctors in New Delhi who only make 35,000 euros a year, while you guys make a million a year. So that's why this is not the future. Then I lost them again. Then they said, this is totally impossible in the near future. It's amazing how our brain works if we are confronted with new technology and looking for ways to use it in our common practice. Good. So for the next 45 minutes, I'm trying to, to wonder you, to amaze you, uh, and maybe parts of my story uh, you don't like because it gives you a feeling of insecureness or maybe even fear. But my story is about the transformation of the world uh, to a next phase in society where the focus will shift from prosperity to well-being. So we're transforming to a total better world where we take care of each other and the focus is not only on making money. Good. So to see the world transforming, the world is transforming and is getting upside down. So if the world is getting upside down, what do you need to do to see the world in the right way? Well, then you have also to go upside down. You have to stand on your head, otherwise you see the world upside down. So I ask the board of, uh, of Holland Casino, by the way, this is a good exercise. If you think this is, a, this is an ignorant uh, Maasai warrior in Africa uh, with a big hole in his ear, then you are not turned upside down. This is an example of hands-free calling, uh, uh, on, only in a different way. So, so you have to look at the world upside down. And I asked the board of directors of Holland Casino, uh, who, who invited me to do a workshop uh, last year, and their biggest question was, um, uh, do we need to go online? And I needed to answer that question in a full day. Can you imagine a full day answering the question, should we go online as a casino? in 2014? You can answer that in five minutes. So I, my biggest concern was how, how, how get me through the day just with this question. Uh, and then I asked them, what kind of company do you see here? And they didn't see it, what you see immediately. And you see that this is a casino. And they didn't see it because in their mind, the casino is a building uh, with a lot of people and roulette tables. But that's not what they see here. But you see immediately that this is a casino because the guy here on the iPad is playing blackjack. The guy on the iPhone is playing roulette. The guy with the Apple computer is creating his own gamble, gamble game, which will be in a store within uh, an hour and for sale uh, for 99 cents. The guy with the cigarette just lost all his money and is thinking how I'm going to tell my mother. Uh, and the guy with the drinking coffee, he is not 18, so he's not in a position to gamble. So you see immediately that this is a casino, but only when you are upside down. 
And the world is changing radically, rapidly, uh, in many ways. How strange is it? If I t told you, let's say, a year ago, or ten years ago, even better, if I told you ten years ago that there will be a taxi firm, Uber, uh, making a lot of money with a value, a market value of 80 billion dollars, who has no taxis and no taxi drivers. Would you believe me then, ten years ago, that that's the situation? Probably not. Probably not. Or that the world's biggest accommodation provider, who, who, who provides 400,000 sleeps a night, Airbnb, doesn't own accommodations. Would you believe that ten years ago? It's, it's twice time bigger as Hilton. And in Hilton, 165,000 people are working to accommodate 200,000 sleeps a day. And with Airbnb, only 425 people are working to accommodate 400,000 sleeps a night. Isn't that amazing? Is the world not changing in, an, in a dramatical way, in, an, in a way that we can, that we can imagine? Uh, do you know that, that the world's uh, uh, fastest growing bank, Society One, it's an Australian bank, it's the world's fastest growing bank, doesn't have any money? It's a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. Entrepreneurs lending money to other entrepreneurs. Individuals lending money to other individuals. That's what the bank is doing, only this is not a bank. This is a corporation of people and businesses lend lending each other money. The fastest growing bank in the world has no money itself. That is what's happening outside. Maybe not here in Latvia, although uh, I saw many examples of fantastic innovations in this country. It's even, even more odd when you look at, for example, uh, Philips Lightning. Philips Lightning create bulbs, lamps. And the lamps, <coughs> excuse me, and the lamps burn for 500 to 1,000 hours and then they bust. Then they are not operating any longer. It's a sort of Volkswagen software in it. And the lamps for, for 500 to 1,000 hours uh, are done replaced. So what we buy from Philips is a lamp, but it's not what we need. We don't need a lamp. What we need, the added value of Philips, is light. What we need is light, but we buy a lamp and close an electricity contract uh, with, uh, with a provider. So what we need is not what we buy. That's an important thing to look at businesses in the future. What is the customer really buying? Is it, is it buying your product? Is it buying your service? Or is it buying your service or product and the added value created by it? And what might be the substitute of that product or service in the near future? So now, huge architect agents and huge uh, 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 real estate owners over all the world, huge companies with owning millions and millions of square meters on offices, said to Philips, we're not going to buy lamps anymore and we're not going to close any electricity contracts. What we buy from you is light. We buy from you two million lumen a month. And if you need to deliver lamps and electricity to give us lumen, light, that's up to you. So now we buy not a product, we buy a service. And you say, well, that's not very weird. It is. Because what happen what's happening in this shift, in this transformation from a product to a service, Philips now suddenly has an interest in building lamps that doesn't burn for a thousand hours, but it creates now lamps that burns for 20,000 hours. Because it's in their interest. And Miele, who is a, a producer of washing machines, doesn't create washing machines that remain for eight years. Now, as they are delivered as a service, you don't have to pay for the machine, only you pay for every time you use it, a dollar or whatever. They start creating washing machines that remain for 25 years because it's in their interest to deliver a product that remains as long as possible, because then they make more money. So what we buy is the product, is the value that we really, really, really need, and we pay per use, 
and it has huge impact on the business model, and it has also fantastic impact on, on sustainability and footprint, because if a washing machine now is still working after 20 years instead of five years, or a lamp remains for 20 years instead of a, a, a thousand hours, we need less resources from Earth to create the value we need. Huge positive impact on footprint, on climate, uh, uh, and on environment. Just by swapping the purpose of your added value from ownership to service. So the question for you, the question for you is, what is the added value you deliver? Is that your product? Or is that something value behind your product? Kodak was not selling a camera or, or uh, uh, something in the camera to take pictures. Kodak was selling a device to record memories. That was the product we bought. And then when that product, when that, when that added value was delivered by a phone, it meant the end of the camera. So we were not buying cameras. We were buying a device to record memories. We were not buying CDs. We were buying listening to music. So now we have digital jukeboxes all around, and that meant the end of the world of creating CDs. You, you see what happened? So the big question for you is, what is the, my product? What is the added value that they're really buying? And then you can start thinking about substitute. Is it easy to substitute in the near future by something totally different? And not by selling a product, but by delivering a service. It's amazing, eh? And if you think that this is the future, wrong. This is already happening for years. It didn't in, eh, infect you maybe today, but it will definitely infect you over the next coming years. Who thinks that the world will change radically over the next 10 years? Please raise your hand if you think that the world will change radically over the next 10 years. That's less than 50%. Uh, so the one who says, well, what is radically? If you don't give a definition of radically, I can't answer this question. Uh, my, my story is particular for you. So let's see what is going on and, and, and see if the world is uh, changing radically uh, and, and needs to change radically. Who is following the world of teleportation? Anybody here has some knowledge of teleportation? Uh, for the one who says, what is teleportation? Uh, Star Trek, the 80s, beam me up, Scotty. That's teleportation. So that we are able to teleport a human being, or let's say molecules, from one place on the Earth in a nanosecond to the other place on Earth in a nanosecond. Is that radical if we can do that? Is that radical for DHL? It is, if we can do it, don't you think? I will share with you just an example how far we are with this technology. Uh, have a look at TEDx uh, this afternoon, uh, or, or, or tonight, uh, find a TEDx video uh, by Professor Michio Kaku, who is a world authority and uh, professor at Stanford University in California. Uh, and this video will tell you that we are already able, it costs a lot of money, but that we are already capable of uh, teleporting complex molecules from one place on the Earth to another place on the Earth in a nanosecond. This, this Jacob Cohen genes are, are complex molecules, which means that if you forget the price you have to pay to do so, that we can teleport from a stock somewhere to my replicator at home if it's payable, genes, I just fit size 36. Of course, I doesn't fit 36, and it is teleported straight back in stock at the shop. We already are able to do so. And you might say this is not radical, uh, but then you have to give it some more thoughts. Uh, it's just a matter of time that this kind of technology will become affordable for everybody, and then it will change the world radically, and that will happen in the next 10 years. So if we look at the transformation of the world to a next phase of society where there will be a better world than we have today, you must understand that there are two main drivers beyond this transformation. One, and I will give you examples, are exponential technologies. I will give you more examples of technologies who are already here and are radically changing the world. And the other driver, the other big driver, are a couple of crises in our systems, in our entities, in our institutes. And I start with that, so that you understand that the pain and the insecurity and the, and the sadness in this 
crisis is what we need to transform to the next phase of society. <coughs> We have uh, a couple of crises, huge crises, we are facing for the next, uh, for the next decades. Uh, and I divide them in three categories. One is, in, is, is the world of the e e ecological crisis, climate and environment. The other is an economic uh, environment, uh, where we have created a world that's not dealing with the interest of all people. And the third is a spiritual crisis. I give you examples of, uh, of all three. Um, Let's, let's start here with what I call the environmental crisis or the ecological crisis. Uh, if we have, let's say here, our 7.5 billion people who are living at the world at the, at the current moment. 7.5 billion people. And if you see how we consume and produce stuff and how we extract resources from Earth, with 7.5 billion people, we extract from the Earth 150 of resources while the Earth is only creating 100 a year. So for the past decades, we are stealing a lot from Earth and it cannot, it cannot speed up with, 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 with what we need. And, and, and if you see how much we pollute on, on toxic and CO2 emission, the world, the atmosphere, the oceans can deal with 100, but what we pollute is 170 with 7.5 billion people. That's how we live today in the Western world. If you think that can continue for decades, you're wrong and naive, because nature is already sending invoices. And that's what they're talking about in Paris at this very moment. So if you see how we live here in Latvia, in the Netherlands, in England, in America, uh, and, and, and if everybody in the world, if 7.5 billion people start living like you and, and the Dutch people and the English and the France and the Germans, if everybody in the world would consume like we do, the world offers space on resources for 1.5 billion people. So currently, if we start consuming all the same 7.5 billion, we need five planets. That's where we are in 2015. If we all start living like the people from Rwanda, uh, the Earth will have enough space for 15 billion people. But nobody wants to live like the people from Rwanda even the people from Rwanda. <laughs> right? So that's, that's an ecological crisis, uh, and we're going to deal with that over the next decades, and that will transform the world to a new phase in our society. Otherwise, we can't resolve it. Another economical crisis, just one example. If we have here the world of uh, speculation, uh, 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 the world of um, uh, 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 valuta, uh, exchanging uh, 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 coins, exchanging uh, of the coin system, uh, to trade in, in dollars or in yuan or in whatever. If that's, if that's a hundred, this international trade in money, if that's a hundred, and you compare it with the real economy, with let's say all trade over all continents, and you compare it with the hundred of a world that is only speculating and doesn't create any value, for other people. This world is 100, and the real economy, trade over all continents, is then 1.2. In that world, we live. Isn't that amazing? Don't we need to make a little bit room for our children to create their own reality and start challenging us that we need to create a different world because we're going in the wrong direction? Do you create enough room at home for your children to create their own reality and their own ambition and their own dreams? Or are you projecting your values to your children because they have to live in your world? Or the same question for you, for your young managers and your high potentials in your companies? I think that the best children you can have or the best young management you can have is those who are extremely critical about what you do and how you do it. Because then you start learning and changing and creating a better world instead of staying in this world with, with a lot of errors and discrepancies. And if you look also at the spiritual crisis, which is another reason why we need to transform to the other world, I give you some examples. If you look at Europe and you look at the world of suicide among kids between 4 and 14 years old, then suicide is the death cause number one among kids between 4 and 14. So more kids between 4 and 14 are dying than due to accidents or illnesses. What do we in our society that this is happening? 
Why do we have people, planet, profit, people, planet, purpose, people, planet, performance? That this is the result for our children. What do we wrong? If you look at uh, people who have a burnout today, I'm talking about a spiritual crisis. If you look at people who have a burnout, one third of the people who have a burnout is younger than 30 years. What do we wrong? in our companies. Why are we managing our companies through spreadsheets and key performance indicators? And we don't see what kind of impact we create on people and their mindset. In my country, which is among the modern societies in the world, in my country more people are ill at home with mental problems instead of physical problems. Almost 60% of the people sick at home in my country is suffering with mental problems instead of physical problems. Isn't that a signal of something? What is happening in our society? I think it is. And, and, and I'm trying to my children and my students to give them a different mindset so that they can create another world where these kind of problems does not exist or when they start solving them. And the question for you is what do you do today, yesterday and tomorrow to deal with these problems? and be part of the creation, the transformation to the next phase of our society? Or are you just making money and living your life? So the elite, the economical elite has managed us, has led us to a state of organized irresponsibility and they create outdated old solutions for huge new challenges. So what is going on and I'm, I'm sure that, that it's also something you feel here in Latvia. What there is going on is that something is dying, something is ending and what is dying and what is ending is a society where bigger is better, where, where having is better than sharing and where maximize me is the norm. That world is ending, that world is dying. And there's a new world getting born. It's the world where we, where we really long to, we really, really desire from our heart. A new world is getting born. It's, it's still uh, in, 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 in the stomach and it wants to be born and we can't see what it is. But it is the future. And the future wants to become manifest through you and through you and you and your children. The only thing we need to do is to give it space to, to be born. And it will be born with a different mindset. If we change our mindset from making money to creating value for others, then the legs get a little bit open and the new baby can be born. Are you part of it? Are you part of, of the fight against the transformation to the new world? Or are you part of the transformation by being the change you want to see in the world? Where are you? And what do you do? What was the last time that you did something for somebody else that created more well-being for him or her unasked without any expectation? What was the last time that you created real value, happiness for somebody else without being asked? Very good, ma'am. This morning. Fantastic. And if you do it tomorrow again and next week again, you know what happened? A lot of people are getting happy and it will also make you happier. Because the heart will give you instant return if you create value for other people. Maybe not right away a lot of money, but instant return in happiness. And that's, why, that's our universal goal, being happy. Stay happy. Die happy. With your last breath like this, You tell your children and your partner and your friends in your last breath that you only had one life, but that it was so fantastic because you created so much value for other people that one life was enough. Don't we all want to die that way? If you want to die that way, and I definitely want to die that way, you better shift your mindset and start thinking of creating value for other people. And start asking yourself, what did I do and when did I do for the last time create happiness for somebody else? So we have to go back. We have to go back to the source. We have to go back from our brain to our heart. Not only in our daily life, but also with our business. 
We must start thinking in people, planet, but not in profit. Profit is, is a result. Profit is a result of good leadership. Good leadership is doing the right thing. In a proper, lean and mean way. That's management. Good management. And then if you have a collective purpose, creating value for others, you will make money as a result, not as a goal. If making money is your purpose, your last breath will be like this. It wasn't enough. So the real three P's are people, planet, purpose, creating value for others by your business. So these are some examples of why, why the world will transform to the next phase of society. And then we have a second huge category uh, of uh, a, a driver uh, that will change the world radically, and that's called exponential technologies. Look at the growth, the exponential growth of computer power. I don't have the time to go in every detail. The only thing I want to share with you uh, uh, on this picture is that at 2015, one computer already has the power of the total mind of one mouse. That's where we are today. Within 10 years, one computer will have the brain power, the, the capacity of one human brain. Within 10 years, one computer. It's not a quantum computer, it's still a Pentium computer. So in 2025, a computer will have the power of the brain of a very intellectual. And before the half of this century, before half of this century, we will have a new generation of computers, and one computer will have the power of all human brains living on this world. Do you think that this will change? the world radically? You bet. Only it's our duty, our responsibility to use it and to transform it in a proper way so that the advantages are available for everybody instead of only the 10% most rich people in the world. And the good thing is, in this new world where everything is transparent and where we have social media to connect, we, as a society, can prevent that this kind of technology is only used and sold by the rich on the world to become richer. Only you need a different mindset. You have to make, make space for your children to create a different mindset. And then we can deal and cope uh, with this kind of exponential growth. Do you know that already in 2015 we have 8 billion sensors in the world who are communicating with the internet? 8 billion sensors. In 2020 it will be 50 billion sensors communicating with the world. And in 2030 it will be 1 trillion sensors in products in our hand, in pills in our stomach, who are communicating with the world, with systems and with people. One trillion sensors communicating and acting as computers. Do you think that this will change the world radically? You bet. And your challenge as an entrepreneur or as a parent is how are we going to use this technology to create a better world for my children and next generations? Are you doing that? Do you long it? Do you, do you desire it? Yes, of course you do. So do it tomorrow and yesterday and in a week. And if you do it to create value for others, you will make money as a result, not as a purpose. Look at this Eiffel Tower. Uh, it could be three printed, uh, 3D printed in 2007, costing $35,000. Today it costs just a couple of tens. Uh, an exponential uh, improvement of 400 times in just eight years. This is the speed of change in the world. We can print a skull on a 3D printer for $70,000. We put it on a hat in an academic medical center in our country. And after three months, this woman was able to do work again. A 3D printed skull. We, we, we had robots in, in the past, in 2008. One robot arm costed a half million. Today, only $20,000. Uh, an, exp an exponential improvement of almost 25 times in just five years. 
creating energy uh, by, solars, by solar panels. In 1984, it costed for one kilowatt 25 euros, today less than 10 cents. This is what I call exponential growth in capacity of technology. Another example, Dan Barry, uh, a former astronaut, uh, was at, 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 at Apollo using at his Apollo machine a gyroscope which costed a hundred million dollars in the 80s. Today you can develop a drone, you can build a drone your own for two hundred dollars with the same gyroscope. And if you look at the world of brain to computer communication, this is how far we are. Plane is think open. And there. Uh, the shoulder up. Or the shoulder back. Shoulder extend, ready. What you see here is computers, hardware and software, that are his limbs. Hardware and software. And like my arms and hands are now moving using my brain. These limbs, this hardware and software, is managed, is controlled by the brains of the guy you just saw. That's not the future, that's today. Only it's very expensive, but I just gave you examples of how fast capacity is growing and how fast costs are declining. And that will happen here too. So in five years, technology will be available for you and your children at school where they start giving directions and instructions to computers not using keyboards and a mouse, but just communicate by their brain straight to the computer before 2022. It's affordable. Do you think that this will change the world of education radically? Yes, it will. And my last example is this one. We are now capable of sequencing DNA. Sequencing DNA was, was, was done for the first time in, in 2000 and it costed 2.7 billion dollars. In 2020, sequencing your DNA will cost one cent. That's less than flushing your toilet. That's what's going on out there. So what's the impact? The impact of this is that over the next 10 years, 70% of the, of the companies who are quoted at the Standard & Poor will not be there anymore in 2025. And 40% of the Fortune 500 companies will not be there in 2025. And they will be replaced by new companies or substitutes that are 10 times better, faster and cheaper than they are. So your challenge is, how do I become 10 times cheaper, better, and faster so that I can survive the average life of a company, which is in 2020, eight years? If you download the presentation, you will see 10 elements, 10 characteristics of an exponential organization uh, who might be your competitor uh, and doing your work 10 times faster, cheaper, and better. So I finalized my story. I finalized my story of the transformation to the next phase of society by sharing with you my vision that we are in the middle of a technology revolution which creates a lot of disruption. And the good thing about this is that it invites us to create a new way of thinking. I gave you some examples of a new way of thinking, of a new thinking about what do you produce, what do you create, and what is the real value of it. And can it be transformed to a service so that you can stay in business because products will get out of fashion? It's all about having access to and sharing instead of owning. And this creates an evolution to the next phase. It gives us a new way of living and then we can evolve over the next two, three generations to an improved quality of life for billions and billions of people who don't have any perspective at the moment. And the good thing is that profound forces today, like exponential technologies I shared with you, do-it-yourself innovators in a garage, crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, and new emerging markets. Over the next 25 years, 3 billion people will get access to the Internet and will get access to academic education. 
which means that if they start thinking about innovation in their garage, we will have much, much, much more innovators than we have today. And your country, with a high potential eh, and a lot of academic people, eh, and with your next generations also access to universities, means that you can become one of the best innovators in the world. Only you need a different mindset. Swap from making money to creating value. And what, 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 if you look at, at uh, the best exponential organizations today, they all share one characteristic. And that is that they have a profound purpose, which is creating value for others. They have a massive transformative purpose. Look at the mission statement of Cisco, shaping the future of internet by creating incredible value and chances for our customers, employees, investors and partners within our ecosystem. Fantastic. But if you translate that to a profound purpose, which I did for them, uh, it means connecting everybody, everything, everywhere at all times. You see the difference? You feel the difference of what their added value is. And the only thing you need to find, for you as an individual and for your business, is a profound purpose. The answer at the why question. Not what and how, but an answer for the why question. And if you have found an answer for the why question, you must realize that nothing changes unless you involve yourself in the change you want to see in the world. This is and a nice saying done by Gandhi. And then one tip which are maybe a little odd to, to close my presentation. Uh, if you look at exponential and successful organizations, uh, particular, uh, there was an investigation among stock quoted uh, uh, companies with a value higher than $10 billion, an, an investigation of six years. And what they found out is that corporates, big corporates, uh, with a domination of men only in the top had a value of 25% less than companies where also women were on the board. I'm not telling you that you should hire more women in, in top uh, uh, positions. The only thing I share with you is that the company who does create more value and has a higher uh, quotation, higher value on the stock exchange. 25% more if you have females on your board. Isn't it amazing? I advised yesterday a huge company in our country, uh, not yesterday, the day before, uh, EHC, which is one of the bigger builders of uh, um, uh, uh, sea ships. Uh, I advised them, uh, first I asked them, uh, how many people in top, f uh, in top positions are younger than 30? And I asked it to the, the top 100 of the company, none. Everybody in the top function at that company was older than 35. No one was 25. So what I advise them is find, and there's a company of 7,000 people, find 50 brilliant people, not older than 25 in your companies, and connect everyone, everybody, one individual of 25, to one of your leaders. And do reverse mentoring. And ask the older guy with all the experience to transform his experience to the youngster and invite the youngster to share his view on the world and knowledge about new technology to the older guy who is still living in the time of dinosaurs. And I've seen companies where they have reverse mentoring, where a guy from 25 or a girl from 25 is working together with a guy from 50, 55 and there is no hierarchical difference between them. They help each other, they are soulmates and they learn from each other. Just very simple things that you can implement tomorrow in your company. So I close my presentation uh, with a, a famous saying of Dr. Seuss. And Dr. Seuss uh, writes book for children. Today you are you. That is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you that says that you can make the difference as an individual if you find the path using personal leadership. You can make the difference 
even if you are part of a company with 6,000 people, you can make a difference. You can make a difference for your children. You can make a difference for your neighbor. You can make a difference for Latvia if you swap your mind and start thinking about creating value for others. So I summarize my speech, my story, in 10 words of two letters. Summarization of my whole story, 10 words of two letters. If it is to be, it is up to me, 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 me. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ruth. Scary and encouraging at the same time, I must say. Well, we've got time for two or three questions. Div trīs jautājumi, tad gan jāiet uz priekšu. Paceltas rokas. Lūdzu, lūdzu, lūdzu. Tur pašās beigās. I will also be available uh, during the coffee break if you have uh, more questions or if you have a personal question. I will be here for the next 30 minutes available for you. All right? Fantastic. Anybody? Two questions for now. Yes. Hello. Hello, uh, sir. Hello. What is my your name? name? Is, my name is Gint. Hello, Gint. Uh, yes. Uh, nice to meet you. Thank you for a wonderful speech. Uh, Thank you, sir. My question was that actually regarding the environment, there are two countries, China and the United States, which really produce the uh, majority of the pollution in the world. I agree. So actually, what we do here, in Latvia especially, but in Europe in general, doesn't matter so much. So we need to convince them. How can we do that? Yeah. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, I, I have. I, I'm, a very, I'm a very strong believer that Paris uh, this week will make a change. Uh, uh, but not enough, to be honest. Uh, so, unfortunately, I have to say that the only thing that will change China and the United States, because not only U.S., it's also China, uh, is uh, where nature is going to help us in the second part uh, of this century. Uh, in the next, oh, sorry, in the, in the second part of this century, temperature of this world will be risen by four degrees, which means that we can start selling ice to Eskimos because they don't have it anymore. Right? It's, it, it sounds like a joke, but it's serious, the situation. So what will happen in the second part of this century, we will see 35 million refugees a year coming to Europe and the United States because parts of Africa and Asia are flooded or too hot to live in. And that will change everything and everybody in this world, including China and the United States. And you know why? Because we have no choice. So I'm a very, it sounds like a pessimistic story, but it isn't. It's a fantastic story because we will change, only we're going to use a lot of pain uh, and a problem created by nature. But the good thing in this story is that the three billion people who will flee from Africa and Asia to our world will get access to education, health care uh, and a better life. And that's the good story of it. Thank you. Um, you had a very good presentation you, regarding technologies, uh, but basically you covered the area where investments to develop those technologies yes. is huge. Yes. Uh, we cannot even dream about such a, a, an amount in, of investments. However, yeah. you also uh, pictured a big area uh, of innovations where Prob which probably uh, would uh, require a lesser uh, amount of investments to, to develop. So, the, um, well, can you somehow characterize that yeah, I will, picture? I will, I, will, I will give you an example okay. of how we can, how we can uh, create a better world using new technology and the advantage that comes with it is shared by the big, uh, uh, the, the big society. Uh, and uh, it's very nearby, that example. Uh, Apple will introduce its autonomous car in 2019. It's, uh, it was originally planned in 2022, but in 2019 you can buy a fully autonomous car. Uh, uh, that means that in 2030, 2040, more than half of the cars here in Latvia or in Europe will be autonomous cars. 
uh, with huge advantages because 95% drop in accidents, which means that half of the hospitals can be closed. So that's a nice example for the doctors I mentioned earlier in my story. But the big, the big challenge we have here is how do we finance, uh, let's say, millions of cars in Latvia which are autonomous cars. You don't need to own a car anymore because there's always one available out there. As soon as you push a button on your iPhone, there's a car waiting for you asking, where do you want me to bring you to? And you just step in and step out and it goes away and find another, another passenger to bring. So you don't need to own a car. It's a nice example of owning to sharing and having a mobility from A to B at the time you need it. And in this world, sir, we need to find a financial institute, what is today called a bank. And a bank needs to transform not to a financial institute, but it needs to transform to a facilitator of evolution. And as a facilitator of evolution, you can cope with 3% um, um, result uh, on, on invested capital. So that if we create, let's say, a corporation called the Latvia uh, Autonomous Car Corporation, owned by all Latvians, financed by a bank who is now a facilitator of evolution, you can finance new technology, and if it makes more money than the 3% we give back to the facilitator of evolution, we can use that money to increase the network or start investing in other areas. So it's a mindset of banks, of you as a society, to create an entity that deals with the interest of society, instead of that this kind of technology is only making more money for the guys in Silicon Valley. It's a mind swap, and you need to organize yourself as a society, and we in our country, and we as Europeans need to, to reorganize the way we cope with added value so that we all are beneficial in, it, in the system. And we have the transparency in the world already, only we need a little bit more pain and confidence that we can change the world together. Is that an example you were looking for? I more was looking forward to, to see uh, some uh, technological areas, but uh, what you mentioned is it's also worth considering. However, uh, as much as I understand in, in investment uh, things and the money, if uh, an organization is uh, taking um, outside money, it's uh, responsible uh, according to law and it has to... Um, uh, report to, uh, to, to to government organizations. So, so it's it basically it's not so easy. To no, I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but if if you allow me, uh, and I look at the chair, can I can I give one more more answer to, to this in particular? In really short, yeah, I, will, I will share with you one example of that's already happening. We, we invested in a, in a company called Storedot in 2007. And, and, and I was, let's say, an, an impact investor. I was looking for creating a better world by using money. Uh, and if we had a return, it was nice. So it was already a different mindset. And we invested, look at the uh, internet tonight, for a company called Storedot. And Storedot developed in 2007 a battery for mobile phones which can be charged in 10 seconds and then remains up and running for three days. The technology will be available uh, after this summer for less than $100. And then in 2009, in my last days at this fund, Elon Musk from Tesla came on board. And he said, this is very interesting technology for his cars, obviously. I want to buy this company. And the company was owned for 60% by the three founders who were all younger than 35. And I said, I want to buy this company. And these three guys said to him, to Elon Musk himself, the, Mr. Tesla, uh, we're not interested in your millions. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about millions. I am talking about billions. And these three youngsters said, we are not interested in your billions, sir, because this technology must be available for BMW, for Mercedes, and also for other industries, because we are here to create a better world and not to make a lot of money. It's already happening. Thank you. Thank you. The very, very, very last one. I hate to say that. Would you? Hello, Ruth. Hello. Uh, I'm Igor. Thank you for the lecture. It's a very you. strong lecture, Thank in my you opinion. Much. Ruth, uh, I also will have some maybe long question, but I have also some thoughts about uh, the speech All you right. uh, described to us. Yes, Ruth. Um, as I see, yes, you also said what uh, today we need five planets 
yes, uh, to we keep all, all the like... people here, yeah. yes, in the world, yes. And uh, second point, what every people should think not uh, about earning money first, but should think about the adding real value yes. to the, our people, yes. But uh, as Maslow's here, here of needs says, but first every man thinks about the meal, yes. What's the rough uh, reality of our world, yes. And uh, what I'm thinking, what uh, here also mm, we have some maybe ideas about the gold billion of people on the planet, yes. And when, uh, when I began to think um, if, for example, some leaders in the world, leading countries in the world, like America maybe, etc., uh, how we can give uh, the place to every man on the planet, for example, yes, to be rich, yes, to be healthy, etc., uh, when we should have five planets. Yes, what's the problem? I think your idea and mission is very strong and very right, in fact. We should add, think about adding value. But the problem is what instead of 7.5 billions, we should have just only one billion, and it means what six billions of people can't find meal first, and that's why we can find we can, we can fault uh, about the adding real value to the clients. Yeah, I, I understand your question, and, and of course it's very it is an existential question you you ask, uh, and I'm an optimistic, but not for the let's say the next two three generations. It will take more time, uh, but uh, what I what I believe in, uh, and and I believe that my children and their children and their children they will create the world because they will have a different mindset than I will have, uh, and what they will see, what the, what they will see is that that there is plenty plenty of food, if you look at today, there is plenty of food, although a, a, million, a billion people are starving, but that's not because of a lack of food, that's because of uh, a distribution problem. Uh, we waste more than 50% of our food, uh, so if we start rethinking how we can distribute and solve with dictators, uh, uh, then there's plenty of food. Uh, so this is, this is just a, another way of looking. But what we really need is a reshuffling of, um, of money, of economics, uh, of value. Uh, and I believe, uh, and, uh, and I am... Um, I I'm, I'm, I'm criticized in my country because I'm, I'm favoring what I call a basic income. Uh, uh, but, but I believe that in this new world, uh, there will be an income for everybody. Even if you don't work, you will get $1,200 from the government. Even if you're rich, you get $1,200. If you're old, you get $1,200. And why? It means that you can live, you have a, a house to live in, and you can feed yourself, and then you can use your creativity and your mastership to start creating value for others, because you don't have to think about uh, your existing life. Everything is in place to live, to, to have a house, and to eat. So if we start thinking in giving everybody 1,200 euros, it's only a matter of how do we finance it. Uh, because that's the challenge. It's not uh, the question of, um, of uh, uh, will people get lazy if they get 1,200, because investigations show that nobody can, 15% get lazy and 85% start doing work for others. So the only thing we need to do is to refinance our economies and find a way in taxing uh, so that we can create money for everybody. And there is enough. Uh, so, for example, if you have people who speculate with their money and they have a billion and they say, well, I do it in shares, I do it in, in, uh, in, in oil and whatever, and they don't create value and, and one, point, uh, one billion becomes 1.2 billion, uh, leave them with the billion, but say this 200 million you earned, you create nothing. So from the 200 million, half of it is for us to finance basic income for others. It's a mind shift. And I am teaching my students at the universities and the children and their children to start thinking like this so that they can create a better world that we don't have the problem you just mentioned. I understand you said uh, you are also meaning something like Finland plan to do, yes? We also plan to uh, pay to every citizen of Finland, uh, yes, 800 euros. Fantastic. Just for what we're Finland, just was born in Finland. If yes. you can finance it mm -hmm. and you can introduce it with Finland first or second, you are an example to the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So we should start thinking of teleporting ourselves to Finland. Well, there are more worse places on yep. Earth. Thank you, Ruth. You're more Thank than welcome. Thank you very much.